The Read to Lead Podcast, Episode 19. Hi, I'm Richie Freeman, a.k.a. Modern Manners Guy and author of Reply All and Other Ways to Tank Your Career. And you're about to enjoy another awesome episode of the Read to Lead Podcast with my friend, Jeff Brown. You know, the, the old law, the old rule of never putting anything online your grandmother wouldn't want to see uh, is is an important one to stand by and to think about before you post things online. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. Hello, and welcome back to the latest episode of the Read to Lead podcast. If you are like me and you love to read or you at the very least desire to do more of it, then you've come to the right place because my goal is to help you develop a more intentional and consistent reading habit because I believe it's essential to your success. We're going to sit down with another successful and inspiring author this week. And this time around, it's a guy by the name of Dave Delaney, author of the new book, New Business Networking, How to Effectively Grow Your Business Network Using Online and Offline Methods. Dave is going to help us learn how to make the most of the conferences you attend, and he'll also help us understand how to leverage social media networks like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus as well. I've had the chance to uh, to know Dave for about six years. He and I live in the same town, Nashville, Tennessee, and it was a treat to get a chance to chat with him, and I am excited to share with you our conversation today. But first, in lieu of a sponsor this week, I want to share with you, um, and I'm actually thinking about making this a regular part of the show. Maybe you can help me decide that, Jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com. But I uh, have the good fortune of uh, being introduced to new people all the time, speaking of networking. And uh, folks have been reaching out to me to do interviews on their blogs and podcasts and whatnot. And I'm discovering a lot of new great content that way. Uh, of course, uh, just a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of being on the uh, public speaker podcast with with Lisa B. Marshall that I told you about. But I recently uh, was reached out to by Deborah C. Owen. Deborah is a high school librarian. Uh, in Massachusetts, and her blog is Einstein's Secret, Provide the Best Conditions for Learning, einsteinssecret.com. And she's a speaker. She writes and consults about teaching and learning in the 21st century, and she gives teachers the best ideas that she can can find and curate to help them create the best conditions for learning. And I've been enjoying her blog ever since I had the chance to be interviewed by her, and she just does a great job. And I thought it worth pointing out to you, not just because she's, she's interviewed me, but because I think she's doing quality, consistent work. Now, Deborah didn't ask me to to share this in exchange for doing an interview with me or anything like that. In fact, she has no idea until she listens to this episode that I'm even mentioning her. But I thought it was worth pointing out because, again, I thought she did a great job. Einsteinssecret.com. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And if there's other content, blogs or podcasts or what have you that you've discovered that is about furthering the cause of reading that you think I should do about and share with Read to Lead podcast listeners, you can send me an email, jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com. Another way you can contact me is by going through voicemail. To do that, just go to readtoleadpodcast.com and click the Leave a Voicemail button that you'll see on the right of the page. That's readtoleadpodcast.com. Dave Delaney is a recognized leader, consultant, and speaker on digital marketing, social media strategy, and business networking, both online and offline. Uh, Dave hosted one of the first parenting podcasts from 2005 to 2008 and has been blogging for nearly a decade. He has appeared in technology articles in USA Today, Billboard Magazine, and Mashable, among others. And earlier this year, he released the book New Business Networking, how to Effectively Grow Your Business Network Using Online and Offline Methods, and he is our guest today. Dave, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Thank you for having me, sir. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, uh, I didn't throw this question out in the, uh, in the pre-interview discussion, uh, but as mm-hmm. I, was, I was thinking about our, our conversation today, I'm of the opinion, and you, you jump in here if I'm way off, I'm of the opinion that folks either really enjoy the networking process or they really hate it. Is there an in-between or is it, are you one or the other for the most part? Um, I think if you're doing it right, it should be enjoyable. Um, I understand that if you're an extrovert or sorry, an introvert and, and have a hard time with it. I I can understand that sentiment 
Um, but I think if you're doing it right, I think you should have a good time and, and enjoy it. I, I think networking events take different shapes and networking itself has had kind of a bad rap over the years. And, mm. you know, some, some events can end up costing a lot of money and take a lot of time and, and, uh, be a little overwhelming and i understand why some people would not get turned on to that idea um but i think networking as far as meeting other people and and seeing ways to help others i think that's enjoyable would you agree that those because this is kind of where i'm coming from those who who look at the process and dislike it maybe uh, is it in part because they're surrounded by people who are quote unquote doing it wrong in other words everybody seems to have something they want to get from you or get out of you and it's kind of approaching it the wrong way um yeah maybe people are doing it wrong but i think networking <laughs> is really as as important as you know things like job interviews and dating <laughs> you right. know whether you hate doing them or not i mean there's still something you need to do mm. so good point good point now i've had the pleasure of knowing you for about five or six years uh and mm. and you and i connected way back when uh, uh, when I was attempting to launch my own chapter of, of the Geek Breakfast, that's something that yeah. you started in Nashville and, of course, has gone. Uh, there are chapters all over the world. Still, though, I've known you for a while. I just really knew bits and pieces. I was fascinated by uh, your personal story from the first couple of chapters of your book, uh, You know, being a new guy in a new town, not knowing anybody. And yet, in, in, in pretty short order, you were able to put yourself in a position to make a dent and, and get noticed by helping people, like you said. Talk about some of the, what you call in the book, homework you did to help make that happen. Well, I mean, the first step, yeah. So, I re- well, I guess backing up, I'm originally from Toronto, and uh, my wife is from uh, Jackson, Tennessee, which is between Nashville and Memphis, and it's about a couple hours away. And so, when we decided to move to Nashville, you know, I knew that I had to, uh, you know, how to meet people here in order to find a job. <laughs> you know, I couldn't just, you know, and I, I was kind of hitting dead ends, searching typical job sites, you know, Monster and, you know, Career Builder and, 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 and things like that. And I mean, they're great in their own respects, but for what I was trying to find more of a, I guess, a senior level marketing position, it was, I was having trouble. Hmm. Um, and I realized that, yeah, you do really have to meet people or you really have to be, you know, actively networking in order to land with your feet on the ground. And so one thing that I did was created, I created a blog about, uh, called New Media Nashville, about uh, sort of the tech scene in Nashville, tech slash marketing scene, I guess, mm-hmm. in Nashville, uh, and started writing about that on a blog before ever moving here. And I didn't do it as this completely calculated, ooh, you know, <laughs> idea to, you know, I, it became a, w- a way to help me build my own personal brand, but, it, but I was doing it more for my own homework so that I would learn from doing it. I would learn about the players and the people and the industries and things that were, that were in Nashville. And, and, but from doing that, it helped legitimize me as, as a person who clearly, you know, was doing his homework. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, doing the homework is, is an extremely important part. And would you say the the blog then was probably the key piece uh, of of being able to branch out and, and connect? Or were there other factors involved, things that you did? Um, for me, because I work, have worked in marketing all of my career, uh, you know, the American Marketing Association, the Nashville chapter, NAMA, seemed like the right place for me to be. And so I found that by researching and then uh, by attending one of the events in Nashville, I got to meet their president who introduced me. Uh, to other people, and which ended up leading me to a job, sort of in a in a short amount of time. Um, it was from meeting one person to meeting another person to meeting another person, <laughs> which I outline in the book and kind of explain exactly my story and how that came to be. So I think researching the organizations, trade, or you know, organizations that are specific to your industry and where you're trying to, you know. F- get into and get and get to get to know people. I spent a lot of time driving, you know, networking, just calling people uh, in businesses that I'd like that I would like to have worked for or people that I just wanted to meet. And so I made a lot of phone calls and a lot of coffee meetings and drove from Jackson to Nashville early in the morning and then back at night and did that (laughs) day in and day out. So I was driving about you know, roughly four hours or more a day. Uh, but, you know, trying to fill up the time during the day, just meeting with people. 
So when you go about it with the right motives, as, as you obviously did with, with help being job one, it really does or can have a snowball effect, can it? Oh, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Well, what advice would you give to the person who struggles with networking? Maybe they don't feel comfortable meeting new people or, or like you said earlier, maybe they consider themselves introverts or, or maybe even don't enjoy for some reason the process. Networking is, is crucial for your career and your business. And I think if you're not making an effort to connect with people, then, you know, good luck. Because <laughs> I think you're, you're going you're gonna to hit roadblocks along the way and you're going to regret it later when you actually need that, mm. that network to tap into and to reach out to. So I think, um, you know, if you're at an event, for example, talk to somebody who's standing alone. You know, there's always someone alone at events, but they're at the event. So the fact that they're at the event means that they've made the effort to go to come to this event. <laughs> um, they may be miserable because they're standing there alone, which is a perfect opportunity for you to go over and uh, and say hello and introduce mm-hmm. yourself um, and ask them, you know, who they are, or what you know, what they do, or what you know, why, what brought them to that event. Um, even speaking to the or it depends on the on the size of the event, but. Speaking to the organizer is a good thing to do. And also talking to the sponsors. The sponsors are always itching to talk to people. They always <laughs> want it. I mean, that's why they pay good money to be there. And the smart sponsors are the ones who won't be, you know, just pushing their products in your face. They'll be the ones that'll, that'll be there to genuinely meet people. And obviously, hopefully, long, you know, down the road, sell their wares. But, you know, sponsors are the ones who are backing it. So they're, they're good people to go and talk to. Oftentimes, be, sponsors will be repeat sponsors, mm. which means that if it's an event that's like, if it's a monthly event and it's a sponsor that repeats, um, that comes frequently, they may know, they probably know other attendees and may be able to introduce you to someone as well. So, and I mean, that's how, jo- that's how you, you end up with jobs sometimes. Mm. I mean, one example of this actually is my book, you know, New Business Networking came from my going to talk to a sponsor table at a conference. Oh, okay. So, you know, there's a lot of work involved in, in trying to write a book proposal and your men- multiple book proposals and just shopping them around and trying to get a deal. Uh, If you choose to go, you know, the the traditional publishing route. And for me, I was at a conference speaking and, uh, you know, Pearson Q had a, had a table and I went over and started talking to Catherine Bull standing there, manning the table. And she ended up being my editor and she, you know, I told her this idea I had and she said, well, send me a proposal. And she sent me the template and I filled it out and sent it to her. And next thing I knew I had a book deal. So, (laughs) and that was just from going over and saying hello to the, to a sponsor, somebody I didn't know. So, Hmm. Well, you spend the, the third chapter in your book talking about some of the aspects of setting up your home on the web about how it needs to be more than, than a welcome mat. Now for somebody ready to begin building their platform online, what are some of the key things to think about in, in putting that together? Well, I think at the very least, you should have some presence on online that is your own your own space. And whether that is, you know, there's services that you can use that are free. Um, there's some paid versions of them as well. But services like about.me or flavors.me um, or there's a Nashville-based company, popular.me. Uh, Th- those are, you know, some good examples of pages that you can set up that are sort of personal landing pages, which have links out. You know, they give you the ability to have a brief bio, sort of, this is who I am. This is what I do. Um, these are the social networks that I belong to, uh, or this is my LinkedIn profile. And, you know, you can include your contact information there. That You should have that at the very least. Um, obviously, having a blog is even better, assuming that you're using it you know, frequently enough. Um, and I go into great detail in the book about the different blogging platforms like WordPress and Blogger and uh, you know Tumblr and things. Um, but I think really creating a blog is, is a great way of, of sharing you know, more about who you are. And, get, and it gives people a chance to, a destination to come to, to learn more about you and to connect with you. And if you're intimidated by the process, like you said, it could be as simple, at least in the early going, as something like an about.me page or, or something along those lines. Right. Now, I'm not a LinkedIn expert, but it seems to me as I connect with people, I'm always surprised to see the number of people who seemingly are grossly underutilizing their LinkedIn profile. Maybe they don't have a picture or uh, some of their job history is missing. Am I close on that or do you need to set me straight? Do you see a lot of folks not doing enough with that resource? Oh, absolutely. Not having a headshot drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just spoke at a conference uh, about, actually it was a 
company training session on LinkedIn. And when I, and I use that as, as an example, you know, in the, in the presentation I had, I, I say that everybody has a pretty face. You all have nice faces. So use a reasonable headshot <laughs> or photo to show, you know, because you're way more likely to interact with somebody when you can see their face. The other thing too, is that LinkedIn, you know, when you send a connection request on LinkedIn, so say we met at a conference, for example, you know, I'm going to send you a connection request and I'm going to customize that connection request because many people use the default one, which right. also irks, irks me. Like, <laughs> um, But sending a personal message saying, hey, Jeff, it was great to meet you at so-and-so conference. Um, love talking to you about podcasting. Uh, here's a link to that article we were talking about or something like that. You know, let's connect on LinkedIn. Let's stay connected. That helps. Right. Um, but also having your face there. I mean, if you're at a conference like South by Southwest or something where you've met hundreds of people, um, it may be hard to put a face to the name. So, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I I know of some a, a manager once who was upset with his sales team. I talked about this in the book actually. Who was upset with his sales team because he noticed through IT, I guess he was monitoring, and he noticed that they were using LinkedIn all the time, and and it was frustrating him because. He thought they were all looking for jobs. <laughs> he was paranoid when really they were savvy enough to be using LinkedIn to find leads hmm. for their sales, uh, for the sales team. So I think it's, it, people don't realize, they think that LinkedIn is just for, for searching for jobs or updating your resume. And so, hey, if I'm, if I'm happily in my job, then why would I need LinkedIn? Which is the wrong way to think because when your job, God forbid, your company downsizes or something happens... Um, then if you haven't built that network on LinkedIn, then, you know, who are you going to call? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I see that, I see that a lot. I see people misusing LinkedIn that way, just misunderstanding what it's all about and why they should be there. And you've got a lot of great resources in the book too. I want to make sure people are aware of regarding LinkedIn specifically and some ways to really leverage it to, to, to use it to its full potential, I guess. I have found, and I know you're a power Twitter user, I've found Twitter to be one of my most valuable tools when it comes to networking and meeting new people. Uh, what are some of your tips for getting the most out of Twitter? I think it's quality over quantity, which is actually consistent with networking specifically. Mm. You know, that's one thing I, I, I bring up a lot about about social networking, Twitter obviously being one of those social networks. But you think of it like networking where, you know, you should be you should be helping other people, you should be promoting other people and interacting with other people rather than just promoting yourself. And Twitter Twitter is fantastic that way. It's fantastic because you can find and establish real relationships there. Um, you know, over time of course, but like any relationship they take time. Um, but I love the fact that I've met so many people on LinkedIn, some I've never met in person. Um, but when I do meet them in person, it's like, you know, it's like, re it's like a high school reunion or, or, may or maybe better than that, I, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> but it's amazing because you get to see these people and you're like, Hey, how's it going? Oh my gosh. And you, you've had all these great conversations and you know each other so well. So I don't know if that answers your question now. <laughs> <laughs> That's close enough. That's close enough. Um, I have found that uh, creating groups on, on Facebook around a particular interest is a great way to get to know like-minded people, which, of course, leads to your ultimate goal. That's you know, networking in real life. And I mentioned earlier you know, the Geek Breakfast group that, that you founded, and, that, and I've been able to, to, to create a chapter and have met some amazing people. I think of like Matt Hollowell and Bill Todd mm -hmm. and Eric Neer and some others. And with Facebook, you have the opportunity to mix the business side and the personal side of your life, depending on your choice of posts and the connections you make and that sort of thing. I've heard some people say they go out of their way to interact only with friends and family on Facebook, and then you know, LinkedIn is that thing for for the business stuff. Is there a right and wrong way to do this ultimately in, in your opinion? The wrong way to do it is to overly promote your business on your personal profile. So bad. Mm. I mean, you can do it so wrong that you could break Facebook's terms of service and they could shut you down. Mm. <laughs> so I would be, uh, I'd be careful with, with using Facebook that way. But yes, I think you should always, when you're posting things online, anywhere online, even an email, you should always be you know, thinking that this is permanent. <laughs> <laughs> and even if it's deleted later, there's usually something there for a while. Mm. And, and if somebody takes a screen grab or a screenshot of it, then guess what? It is permanent. Um, so I think it's, you know, the, the old law, the old rule of never putting anything online your grandmother wouldn't want to see uh, or your mother uh, is, is an important one to stand by and to think about before you post things online. Mm. And that said, though, I mean, Facebook is certainly your, your personal profile on Facebook is a place 
for you to be personal and to connect with friends and to share, um, you know, personal things, pictures of your kids or, you know, funny anecdotes that took place where LinkedIn is more professional. So LinkedIn, LinkedIn, I, I reserve LinkedIn to share articles and interesting studies and, and things that are related to the industry that I work in um, that I believe my uh, followers and friends on LinkedIn will find useful and find valuable. Um, where Facebook, it may be just sharing a laugh, but you can also, there's a fine line, but I, I also think it's valuable to use your personal profile to remind people from time to time what you do for a living. And and that doesn't mean, hey, there's a sale on socks today uh, <laughs> at my company, but, but you know, and, and pushing out coupon codes and such. But I do think it, it's it's valuable to uh, to connect with other people there, as you mentioned, you know, in a group as well. And, and uh, yeah, and, and, you can promote yourself and tell, I mean, what you do for a living is part of who you are. Sure. There's no way around that. And, you know, that's the idea of being social. It's, it's being out there and talking about things that are of interest. And obviously when you spend the bulk of your day and the bulk of your time uh, in your business, whatever the business may be, then that's a big part of who you are. And so sharing stories about that is, is important. I have found uh, Google Plus to be a valuable networking tool. You know, it seems like that's where uh, the early adopters are. But uh, for that holdout who feels the pressure of of setting up another outpost and maybe have held out on on Google Plus till now, what's your advice for them to help determine if it's right for them? Uh, obviously, there are the SEO benefits. Yeah, it's a it's a great it's a great question, and and yeah, the verdict is still sort of out as far as Google Plus being a social network per se. I mean, it is absolutely, but whether it'll catch on to the masses is another question. Um, I believe there's about 175 million users now. Um, which is, you know, <laughs> it's, it's pretty substantial. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think LinkedIn just surpassed Twitter at around 250 plus million. And of course, then we have Facebook, which has over a billion. Um, so I think Google Plus is a valuable place to be. As you mentioned, it's great with, for early adopters. Um, if you're interested in technology, if you're interested in um, visual things like photography and film also, but it depends on where your customers are or where the people are that you are trying to connect with. And a lot of industries, I, I would say, are pro- probably not very well represented on Google+. Hmm. And so you may be not wasting your time being there, but, I mean, you could be you know, spending the bulk of your time elsewhere. That all said, though, as you said, uh, you know, as far as SEO goes, you know, if you have a local business, for example, I think it's very important to have a Google Plus page. Um, you know, and have that local presence uh, in there. I think Google Plus is becoming sort of a bigger part of the strategy of Google overall. Mm. And so having a Google Plus presence, at the very least, having a presence is important. And posting to that profile and page from time to time is important as well. But yeah, certainly as an SEO play, it's important to have a presence there uh, more than anything else. Well, as as your network of contacts grows, what uh, suggestions do you give uh, folks for managing and nurturing that ever important uh, database or list? Yeah, um, I have a whole chapter dedicated to that <laughs> in my book, actually, as a matter of fact. Um, no, uh, I'm a big fan of a, uh, of a service called Nimble, N-I-M-B-L-E, because it, it's like it is a CRM tool but it also like ties in all your social interactions so you can keep up with people that your twitter followers and facebook friends and and whatnot so i think that's important i think just looking back the linkedin contacts app is fantastic for being able to make a comment about someone that you meet um, a private comment so you can refer to that later and you know if we meet and we have kids are similar ages or or similar interests, or, or maybe there's a way, somebody I need to in, to introduce you to to help you out, um, or what you know what you are seeking and how I can help you. These are all good notes to keep track of, and LinkedIn provide that. They're definitely LinkedIn have been you know making great changes over the last while, last year or two, last year especially, and and apps like the LinkedIn Contacts app is fantastic for that. So LinkedIn Contacts, LinkedIn in general, Nimble is great as well as a couple examples. 
Dave goes on in the book uh, to dedicate chapters to uh, things like content, organizing events, uh, business cards that rock, and when to use them. Uh, Before we move on to some other questions, Dave, is there anything else from the book that you'd like to share that we didn't touch on? Just the fact that it's dedicated to my wife, who Hmm. didn't leave me. (laughs) <laughs> While I wrote it, uh, so thanks Heather for for staying for staying by and supporting me. <laughs> that's, that's that's all I have. I, I guess I should also say that if people are interested, they can visit nbnbook.com, which takes you to my site to a, a landing page on on the uh, on the book itself. But it, but on on that page, I also have a link to, to a private LinkedIn group that I I encourage people to apply and or, and and join. I'm not turning anyone away. The reason why it's private is, unfortunately, LinkedIn, like every other social network, have to deal with scam and, mm. you know, or spam, sorry, and scams and phishing schemes and all that. So um, I kept it private to avoid uh, it being kind of overrun by spam and people just posting links constantly. And instead, I'm encouraging people there to really connect with one another and share their own networking tips and, and find ways to help one another. So that's a LinkedIn group called the New Business Networking Club that you can find uh, from nbnbook.com. And we'll be sure to include that in the in the show notes as well. Thanks. Thanks. Um, if you, uh, sort of a broad question, but if you had to narrow, Dave, all the leadership lessons that you've learned down to one central theme or idea, uh, what would you say that is? Treat people the way you want to be treated. <laughs> it's so simple, isn't it? It is. It is. And again, getting back to the mom, uh, that's what my mom taught me. <laughs> and I've always kind of st- stood by that. I, th- I think treating people with respect and yeah, just treating people with respect, I think is such an important thing. Whether they can, you know, there's a lot of people out there that'll discredit people because maybe they can't help them. You know, if I can't sell anything to you, why would I be talking to you right now? <laughs> you know, and it's just the wrong way to be. And I think it, it goes not, it goes beyond leadership into just being a good person. And, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I certainly make mistakes, but I try my best to always just treat people, treat people right. I heard from uh, uh, Chris Brogan uh, years ago. I think you were at that event where he came to Nashville uh, right after Trust Agents. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. He did a, did a book signing. And one of the things he said there, and a lot of folks who are networking and approaching it from that, what can I get out of you sort of mentality, he likened that to, you know, meeting someone for the first time in the real world. And instead of putting your hand out to shake theirs, you put their, your tongue in their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember him saying that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, it is, uh, yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much what it's like. <laughs> I thought that was a great analogy. And I've, yes. I've remembered that all these years later. Yeah. I love it. In that this is a podcast that advances the idea that consistent and intentional reading plays a, you know, a very significant role in business and in life, what role has that played in your career and in your success, would you say? For me, I read a lot of marketing blogs and tech blogs and, and subscribe to a lot of different feeds, uh, so much so that my head sometimes is spinning, <laughs> <laughs> um, which can be problematic. Uh, but You know, I sometimes in the past have sort of, you know, not found myself reading enough books frequently enough. And I've even said it in frustration to my wife before and said, what, what? I haven't read, like she just flies through books. And in part, it's because I don't, I haven't made my, given myself enough adequate time to read, Hmm. to actually sit back offline and read, um, stick the iPad in airplane mode and, you know, (laughs) just, you know, by just some way trying to find the time to read. And, but she said, you know, you're reading constantly, you're reading, you know, news articles, you're reading tech blogs, you're reading, you are reading. It's just, you're not reading books and you need to be. Um, (laughs) yeah. So for me, I, I try to, I try now to spend anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour a day and an hour sometimes is pushing it. Um, but certainly 30 minutes a day to reading, um, reading books, because I think it's extremely important. One thing that I've been trying to do, I'm not the fastest reader and I wish I was faster, but I've recently downloaded an app that I've been using to try to improve this. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately you can't, I haven't found a way to use it with uh, my Kindle books, but I have found a way to use it with pocket. Hopefully this isn't too geeky, but, Mm -hmm. um, so there's an app, an iOS app called ReadQuick. Cool. And you can you can use ReadQuick and set it up with like your Instapaper or your Pocket accounts. And so what I do is that when I find interesting articles, I will put them in Pocket, and then I go to ReadQuick. And what ReadQuick does is repurposes the each article, 
uh, by sh- and then displays the article one word at a time on the screen of my phone. Hmm. And it's a it's this is a method to to teach people to speed read. Okay. And so something that I've been using to help kind of uh, help get through more great content in a day. Um, so yeah, so so far it's been working rather well. Well, that's that's one I hadn't heard of, so I'm gonna have to have to dig into that and 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 speed my reading up, hopefully in the process. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have a couple of, of favorite books from the last year or two, Dave? Uh, that you that you highly recommend to read to lead podcast listeners? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, actually, Eric Fisher and Jim Woods. Eric is also a uh, podcaster uh, with Beyond the To Do List podcast. He and uh, Jim Woods recently produced uh, an ebook called Beyond the To-Do List, uh, and the first, the first, uh, it's the first of a series, and it's uh, called Goals, um, Beyond the To-Do List Goals. You can find it on Amazon. I really enjoyed this. I thought it was a fantastic read, and, and it's a very quick read, too, but they really do a great job of kind of outlining ways to, to, uh, to pick a goal and to stick to it, and you know, there are so many GTD, get things done books and, and uh, apps and productivity apps and productivity books and things. There's millions out there. And, you know, oftentimes you end up procrastinating <laughs> by playing with the apps. And I've been guilty of this in the past, too. And something I realized a while back that, yeah, maybe I should spend less time trying to figure out how to do things and just do them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But Eric, Eric and Jim are friends, and so they recommended I, I, they sent me the book, and I have to say it's very, very good, so I do recommend it. Um, another book that I've been reading, and I haven't actually finished yet, but I'm really enjoying it. It's called The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human, and it's by Jonathan uh, Gottschall, I believe. It's G-O-T-T-S-C-H-A-L-L, um, but a book about storytelling uh, – and, and how to tell great stories. And it's, it's a very interesting read. Um, so I do recommend that. And you can also find it on Amazon as well. And we'll be sure to include uh, links to, to those books in the show notes as well. And I should refer people to episode 11 of the Read to Lead podcast when we had Eric Fisher on as our guest. There you go. Uh, well, before we wrap up, Dave, let us know where we can find you on the web and share with us any new projects, if any, that are coming up that you're working on. Um, you can find me at Dave Delaney dot me, Dave D E L A N E Y dot me. Um, that has my blog and, and information about new business networking, my book as well. And, um, at Dave Delaney on Twitter and I'm at Dave Delaney on most social networks. So you can find me, find me there too, but I'm usually faster uh, replying on Twitter than I am to email. So (laughs) So say hello on Twitter if you like. Well, Dave, it's been fascinating to watch uh, your career over the last five or six years, being a fellow Nashvillian as I am, and uh, it's a treat having you on the show. Uh, the book is great; I highly recommend it. And, it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's the kind of book that you know, if there's just a particular area that you're struggling in, you can open up and go right to that chapter and dig into that particular thing. Uh, so it makes a great resource to have on the shelf to refer back to uh, when you need it. So thank you again, Dave, for being on the show. We appreciate having you and wish you nothing but success. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thank you. Dave's book is going to be especially useful to you if if networking is just something that doesn't come naturally to you. Again, I highly recommend it, New Business Networking. If you'd like to let Dave know what you thought about today's episode and the insights that he shared, uh, you can send him a tweet to at Dave Delaney on Twitter. That's at D-A-V-E-D-E-L-A-N-E-Y on Twitter. To comment on today's episode or to find all the links and resources mentioned today, you can go to the blog, readtoleadpodcast.com forward slash 019 for episode 19. And to leave a comment, just scroll down to the bottom of the page. You might recall I arbitrarily set the end of October as the date that we wanted to reach 100 five-star ratings in iTunes. And I wanted to first start off by thanking those who had left a rating in this last week. We had eight or nine folks who did that. And and these iTunes uh, usernames are, are are just really difficult to decipher sometimes, so I'm going to do my best. I promise to mention those who leave five-star ratings. And everybody in the last week who left a rating left a five-star rating, so thanks for that. PMDT Potts says it's practical, useful, and dynamic. Mark Struzewski, uh, sorry if I butchered that, Mark, says it's a must-listen-to podcast. A. Barutica says content that resonates with my thoughts. Zindrith Calls it great content and gives it five stars. Joshua W. Rivers, there's a name I can pronounce, says it's a nudge in the right direction. 
Uh, Libyan, and the last part here, F-T-E-I-S, don't know how to say that, but calls it an amazing podcast. Kurt D. says he only recently discovered the podcast, and he's been amazed at what he's learned after just listening to the first two episodes. Thank you, Kurt, for that. Cheryl Carver at CherylLCarver.com says it's a great way to keep up with all the books that she may not have the time to read. And then Bill Marsh Jr. says one of the best personal development podcasts I've listened to. He says every episode has connected me with fresh insights, actionable ideas, and great book recommendations. And he says he especially loved the interviews with Ken Davis and Todd Henry. Well, thank you, Bill. You are my new best friend. If you've yet to rate the podcast, you can do that by simply going to readtoleadpodcast.com forward slash iTunes. You can rate the podcast on a one to five star rating and then leave a written review too, if you don't mind. That's how I know who to attribute the rating to. And I'll mention you in a future episode if you do indeed decide to leave a five star rating. Well, did we hit 100 five star ratings by the end of October? Well, not exactly, but we got really close. On November the 1st, we were at 99 five star ratings and reviews. And as of today, November the 5th, I just looked. We're over 100 at 101 five-star ratings. All but three of the ratings, in fact, are five stars. So thanks to each and every person who's participated thus far in that. Couldn't have done it without you, obviously. And though we came a day or two shy of getting to 100 before the end of October, we were there shortly thereafter, so I have nothing to complain about. Again, thank you very, very much for helping spread the word about this show. Well, that'll do it for this week. I hope to see you again next time on the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com and chat with other members at facebook.com slash readtoleadnation. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Honey, you are my shining star. Don't you go away. Oh, baby, I want to be right here where you are until my dying day. Yeah, baby.